Welcome back to our live coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And Alexis and I are joined now by Scott Minard, who is Guggenheim Partners co-founder and global chief investment officer. Scott, nice to see you. Yeah, it's very nice to be here. Thanks for having me again. You've been concerned about the Federal Reserve extending the expansion in a way that could possibly end badly. What do you mean by that? Well, it, when the Fed undertook its rate increases back in 2018, uh, I think they didn't realize how restrictive they were being by ra raising rates at the same time that they were trying to shrink their balance sheet. Um, and so I, I'd been concerned that at some point, you know, something was going to break. Uh, but they seemed so committed that it looked like we were going to go into a recession. And then, of course, we got the famous December meeting where the Fed decided to begin the pivot. And they've cut rates by you know, three quarters of a point. Uh, and, and the pattern here is interesting because it looks a lot like the periods of like 1987 when the Federal Reserve, after the stock market crashed, they reduced rates by three quarters of a point. And, the, and the, the market came back. And then again in 1998, 1998 during the Asian crisis, because uh, again, the Fed did the pivot, three quarters of a point rate cut. And of course, for people who are old enough to remember, uh, it was all that liquidity coming out of the Fed that drove up internet stocks so high. And we had a, a bubble in the stock market. Uh, in in uh, 89 and 90, uh, 88, 89, 90, after the stock market crash, uh, it drove up real estate prices, commercial real estate. And then the banks had to be bailed out and there was a massive credit crunch. So this pattern, the Fed has done this before. They've, they've sought to extend the expansion uh, by you know, pivoting late in the expansion from their tightening cycle. And uh, I think we're just living through the same thing again. Yeah, I mean, does that mean things are going to go splat inevitably? Yeah, inevitably, yes. But, you know, it's, it's really hard for me because uh, I'm an old bond trader. And so, uh, you know, in the short run, you know, if I were trading, uh, you know, especially stocks, I would, I would be long. I mean, we, we're probably due for a pullback right now. But in, at the end of the day, over the course of the next year, stocks, I think, will be a winner. Uh, but when you look at other asset categories like corporate bonds, uh, the amount of debt that has been accumulated because of the ultra-low interest rate policies around the world uh, in the corporate sector uh, is becoming very, very concerning to me. Yeah, talk, walk us through that, because right now there is more corporate debt than ever right. on the books. You are very concerned about the leveraged corporate debt market. You've said right. that before. Do you think that's one of the, the biggest headwinds for, the, for market expansion in 2020? Uh, I think right now, as long as the Fed continues to purchase assets and the ECB and, and the Bank of Japan continue to purchase assets, that, um, that the forces of negative interest rates overseas are going to put a cap on rates in the United States. So I don't really see the crunch time coming until after the Federal Reserve and these central banks decide it's time to turn off the liquidity taps and let's get back to normal. And then uh, the history of normalization isn't that good, let's face it. If and when that happens, what is an investor to do? What can you possibly do to protect yourself right. if you see that that could happen down the pike? Right. Well, I think today uh, I, I would encourage people to stay away from corporate debt. Uh, I don't think you're being paid well enough. Uh, but there are other places like uh, taxable municipal debt is very attractive mm -hmm. uh, on a, a risk basis. Um, and uh, I would encourage people, if they're looking for the next year or two, to continue to stay long the stock market, perhaps even buy high yield bonds. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, there there will come a time when the Federal Reserve decides it's time to raise rates again. And I forget the former chairman of the Fed who once said that uh, expansions don't die of old age. Uh, the Federal Reserve kills them. Right. And so they're in the business of killing expansions. Mm -hmm. And the reason is when inflation starts to be an issue. But inflation is not on right. It's not, not yet. Right. 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 Well, people have been waiting for inflation for a long there time, isn't. though. But uh, yeah. I, I want to shift gears a little bit, Scott, and ask you about something I think you're also concerned about, which is populism yeah. and the rise of populism. And why is that a concern? 
wealth and income inequality causing that? And what are the implications for markets? Well, look, um, the rise of populism is the direct result of the income and wealth inequality in the United States. I mean, we've all heard the statistics about, you know, how the top 10 percent control, you know, 95 percent of all the wealth. Uh, we also know that the 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 uh, difference between, um, you know, management salaries and in normal employees is that that has expanded. Um, so. You know, when that happens historically, uh, that causes a lot of social tension, and ultimately, uh, you know, the through the ballot box, uh, the public will try to get their way. Now, you know, I will say that President Trump uh, this morning in his speech pointed out the fact, and he is right, that for the first time in a number of years, over the last two or three years or so, we've actually started to see. Um, uh, wages rise for mm -hmm. low-wage employees, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, the, the income gap uh, is closing. Uh, the question in my mind is, you know, will we, will we make enough progress soon enough? Because when the American election comes up, uh, you know, at some point you could envision that someone like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, who is not very much in favor of free market activity, could uh, could possibly derail a lot of the, the good pro progress we've made over the last 30 years. I want to talk about um, Larry Fink of BlackRock uh, this past week, talking about climate change. He said it's fundamentally reshaping the investment landscape. W would you agree with that? Well, I agree with Larry in that uh, he is right. Uh, the, the thing I'm disturbed about uh, is the fact that um, while there's an attempt on the investment side to try to uh, do environmentally, socially responsible investing, um, that uh, the criteria is not very well established. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for instance, let me give you an example, right? Uh, energy companies uh, that are creating fossil fuels, uh, you know, a lot of people have labeled them as bad. But the biggest consumer of electricity in the world today are data centers. So who's more guilty in this chain? Is it, right? is it the, 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 the institution that's providing the energy or is it the institution that's demanding the energy? So um, the, my conclusion on this is that uh, until policymakers put in place uh, the incentives, uh, which basically have all stakeholders have it be in their economic best interest to, to start changing some of these patterns. For instance, like a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to ba people that produce a lot of carbon, you pay a lot of tax. Uh, you know, of course, that'll drive electricity rates up, uh, which means data centers will have to pay higher rates. Which but means of course, we'll have to pay maybe. Yeah, it exactly. could be inflationary, looking for that, right? That, that's right. And, but yet at the same time, uh, you know, today it is cheaper to generate a kilowatt of electricity by solar cell than it is by any conventional fossil fuel process. So the utilities have been slow to change because they, they see their business model getting threatened. Uh, and uh, so co-generation where we can, we can all sit around and sell electricity to each other uh, is a threatening thing to them. And so they're trying to hang on to their legacy assets. So again, the right set of incentives uh, to get the transition out of the utility industry that's necessary um, you know, if it's in their economic best interest. I will say this, um, we, unless we act quickly, the possibility of reaching the sustainable development goals by the 2030, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's possible. Uh, and actually at the current pace that we're going uh, on improvement, uh, we should expect to get there by the end of the century. Mm -hmm. uh, if there truly is a tipping point out there, uh, a century away is, is uh, or 80 well, years away is a little bit too too long. <laughs> well, Greta Thunberg right. got on the crowd earlier today when she said, no progress has been made on this front in the past two years that I've been out there talking about the environment. So a conversation that will continue. Scott Minard of Guggenheim Partners, thanks so much. Thanks for having me.